Hi, and welcome to A Considered Craft. My name is Jess, and this is a podcast about the choices we make as we make. I am coming to you today from um, Ocean Beach, California, a San Diego neighborhood that is on Kumeyaay unceded lands. It is March the 2nd, 2022, and before I get into the knitting content, I wanted to acknowledge what I think many of us are feeling right now, as uh, for the last week the world has watched Russia invade Ukraine, and the many layers of tragedy that are unfolding um, for a lot of people in that part of the world and in many parts of the world. And um, I think so many people have been talking about how helpless uh, we all can feel in these situations. And I will also add, I feel my own ignorance about the complications of the geopolitical forces that go into these kind of situations and um, you know, what What are the things we can do when we find ourselves in these times where we do feel helpless and uninformed, at least for me, underinformed? Um, I think that it's been a good reminder about talking to people um, and learning what we can, reading from a variety of sources um, what we can. Um, I think there's also something about um, doing even things that might feel smaller in the greater scheme of things. I think there's a lot of knitwear designers and knitting companies and yarn companies that have been in the position to donate sales, Um, but there are also many small businesses in our community that that is not a financially viable thing for them to do. So finding ways to support people in this making community, whatever that might look like for you, and coming together in knitting and in making and in crocheting and in sewing and in that joy of connection and um, maybe it's finding a Ukrainian pattern, a, a pattern by a Ukrainian designer and connecting into the history of that country. Um, and also I will say my heart is also with many of the people in Russia. I think a lot of us can relate to having your government make pretty horrendous decisions that hurt a lot of people and that does not necessarily represent your values. So I think there's something about um, holding space and empathy for um, a lot of people in these situations. I mean, we, we see racism playing out in those border crossings and lack thereof. We just it's it's a tragedy on so many levels. And so the last thing I'll say is it's it's been a good reminder for me also about if you are in a position to do so, to vote, and who you vote for matters. In terms of knitting content today, I have four finished objects that I would like to talk to you about. I have a number of things on the learning front, little bit of a teaser about some of the works in progress, and I'll save some personal life updates for the end for anyone who's interested in that part. I do also want to say um, another big thank you to everybody who has subscribed, watched, commented, sent me a note. Um, I really, really appreciate it, and um, thank you. So the first project I want to talk about today is the Love Note by Tin Can Knits. So I'm going to insert a picture or a couple of pictures here so you can see this is a finished object that I um, recently gave away to my dear friend and it will go from her older child who's four to her younger child who's two in a little while and um, they were very knit worthy friends and I made this in a kid size four to six it was a super quick knit it took um, 306 meters or 335 yards to make this project so this was fun and quick and um, I made, I'll, I'm going to talk a lot about the yarn and the choices that I made around 
the yarn, but I also want to mention quickly the modifications that I made to this. They were minor and fairly common if you've read any of the uh, notes about what people have done with Love Note. The main thing is that instead of casting on below the neckline and then knitting back up and down, I just looked at what the final neck uh, size stitch count was for the size that I was making and I cast on that number of stitches and knit down. I did a German twisted or old Norwegian cast on. I did five rounds of one by one ribbing and then I just reverse engineered what was written in the pattern as increases. I did them, sorry, what was written in the pattern as decreases to go from here up to the neckline. I just did as increases before starting the um, lace section. The other thing I did with this is that I did not swatch and I often for a garment I will often swatch but for something like this um, it was so small that I just started and knew that I was taking a risk that I might need to switch things up as I went along and I also knew the gauge wasn't super critical because of the way this garment is designed. So I actually had to restart twice because I wanted the fabric to be drapier than it was coming out and usually I'm a loose knitter so I erred on the size of um, downgrading my needle size going smaller and that turned out to not really work with the weight of the yarn that I had and so I just did the top part. I also knew <clears throat> that the yarn was likely to hold up pretty well to being frogged so I wasn't super worried about if I had to unravel something. So that's what I did with the pattern and I am looking forward to making one of these for myself. I think it would be really great to go over dresses or even as a summer, springtime, um, really wearable garment, maybe over a tank top or something like that. So I'm going to think about that uh, for a project over the summer. And I do want to talk quite a bit about the things that went into my decision to use the yarn that I used. So I used... Wimbrel by Quince & Co. Oops, that's the back side. So Wimbrel is a worsted weight um, organic cotton. It's a three-ply high twist yarn. It comes in um, 165 meters for 100 grams, so that's 180 yards. And I used the Bow Spirit colorway, which is this very fun sort of rosy, dusty pink, which I really liked. The kids who are the recipients of this garment really do love pink and purple, pink and purple, pink and purple. And so uh, it was important to me to make them something that was in their desired colorway. So there were a lot of things that went into this decision and part of the reason I wanted to start this podcast was really to talk about and think about and learn together about the choices that we make when we are um, making. So uh, the first thing that was a decision point for me was to work with cotton. Um, I've knit a lot with plant-based and um, man-made materials. For a long time, I did not knit with any animal-derived materials. And so I'm super familiar with working with cotton, linen, hemp, acrylic, all those kinds of materials. And um, I'm also learning a lot about the environmental impact of um, all of those materials, but cotton and acrylic in particular. And so I had to think about like, was this something that I wanted to make in cotton with the pros and cons that each of our material choices have? So I knew it was going to be important to me to choose an organic cotton, but the recipients of this garment live in the deep south. And so a lot of the time their weather is very hot and very humid. And um, the family is um, one that is pretty stretched at the moment with the pandemic. So, you know, a garment that requires more special care, which I have made many of them for this family, all the members of this family, and they are incredibly knitworthy and, and care for those things. But right now was not the time to gift them something that required that kind of care. So I knew I wanted it to be 
washable, machine washable. It didn't have to go in the dryer like that, I think is a reasonable compromise and not a big deal for them. They hang out, you know, their bras and things like that. They, they hang on a drying rack. So I knew that that wouldn't be a big deal, but hand washing was not going to be realistic. And I was not interested in making the choice about, um, using a superwash treatment on any of the yarn for this project. Um, so I wanted an organic cotton. I wanted it to be machine washable. I wanted it to be in a color that I knew the recipients would really like. I also really wanted to support the local yarn store here in San Diego that I have been frequenting. And in fact, I've been there almost every week for a social knitting time that they offer which gives me a really nice opportunity to be in the store for a more extended period of time. And, you know, I see how the owner of the store and the people who work in the store interact with the people who come in. And it's a very busy um, store in a very high traffic area. And people come in that are from all different backgrounds that know more and less about knitting, that know more and less about what they're looking for. And they in my experience in the, you know, the four months or so that I've been going there, I have witnessed nothing but um, what I would say is kind of exceptional customer service and the way that the, the staff is so knowledgeable and so generous. And it's one of those stores that, you know, people walk in and they clearly have these long-term relationships with their customers. And so it felt very important to me to also buy something from the physical store that I have been frequenting. So um, so when I thought about buying um, Wimbrel, the thing that gave me pause is that I have not purchased Quince & Co. yarn in quite some time. And <clears throat> if you have uh, not followed the story of this, this was probably over a year ago now, there have been concerns that were brought to light by um, employees as well as independent designers who were submitting items to them and going through the hiring process about what they experienced that was pretty unfavorable from their point of view. So I'm going to link down below where you can read um, from some of those people directly, I will link below to the statements and the changes that Quince & Co. has announced that they've engaged in as well. Um, and I honestly probably would have made a different choice if all the other things I was looking for could have also been met. But I think this is this is what we're doing when we make. We're constantly making choices and trying to find things that um, balance all of what we're looking for. What is the price point that is in our budget for a project? What is the material we want to use? What is the color we want to use for the look that we're going for? Do we want to support our local yarn store? There are so many factors that go into that equation. And in this situation, I came to the decision that I was going to purchase um, a Quince & Co. yarn. The other thing I'm going to link below in case anyone is interested is that a few people have put together um, yarn equivalents for a lot of the Quince & Co. yarns. So if there is a Quince & Co. yarn that you like and you are someone who does not want to make the same decision I did and you don't want to purchase from them, they've put together lists of alternative yarns for many of the Quince & Co. yarns. Um, I will say it was a joy to work with. This was, I've worked with a lot of different um, cottons and I really enjoyed working with this material. I thought the yarn was really well constructed. I think the garment came out with very, very nice stitch definition. So the high twist in this yarn really resulted in a very nice looking finished object that I don't know how much you can see that on the photos and I don't have the garment anymore to show you, but, um, but it was very nice yarn to work with that did produce a very nice product at the end. So that was object number one. It's a, it's a kid's knit kind of day because the next project I want to talk to you about is another um, kid's knit that is the um, Baby Surprise Jacket by Elizabeth Zimmerman. I really love this pattern. 
as do many other people, because I think there are nearly 30,000 projects on Ravelry right now of the baby surprise jacket. It's something that I often make as a gift knit for people. Um, we just saw some friends when we were in Atlanta on our drive across the country out here. And I looked it up. I made them a baby surprise jacket in February of 2009 for their child that um, is now obviously a teenager. And when we met them, one of the first things that they said to me was, do you know how long we used that um, sweater that you made for our sun. It is a pattern that is just ingeniously designed. I mean, it's really fun to knit because the construction is super wild. It looks nothing like a sweater. And it's not until you sort of fold it a certain way and seam. The only seaming you do is um, across the top from the neck out to the end of the sleeves. That's what you do. And you go from having this sort of origami looking piece of knitted fabric into having a sweater. So it's an it's a it's a very fun knit and also you can you know you can fold up the sleeves that have kind of a built-in cuff in the way that it's been designed and so when the child is smaller, you can fold the sleeves up and this is a little bit longer. But the way the design is, it kind of stretches in multiple directions. So I've had a lot of friends tell me how long wearing this garment was in part because of the genius of Elizabeth Zimmerman and the genius of the design. The other um, design feature of this pattern that I really love and have used in other garments as well is that the instructions call for putting the buttonholes as you place them, you place them on both sides at the same time while you're knitting. And so if you have marked your stitch counts properly to evenly space the buttons um, and buttonholes out, what you end up with is buttonholes on both sides. And the reason that is so ingenious is number one, you when you sew your button on, you're essentially closing up the hole on the side that you're not using as the buttonhole. Um, and but you know that your buttonhole and button are going to line up really well. So particularly in a design where the button band doesn't have ribbing on it, I can find it sometimes a little harder to make sure that the buttonhole and the button are lined up as precisely as I would like. And so this method really helps you get those aligned. The other reason that I find that feature really handy is that um, I have made a number of these baby surprise jackets for friends who um, have not uh, known the birth gender until the birth. And so I will make this sweater in a more neutral um, color palette, leave the buttonholes open on both sides, and then uh, after the baby is born, I can make a decision about which side the buttons go on and if the family I'm giving the gift to is particularly um, sort of into more traditional gender normed colors. I can put buttons on that are really fun. It also means that um, if this is passed down to another child and you take the buttons off, you can switch the side even. So not even switching just the buttons, but you have buttonholes that are underneath the buttons that don't go away. So it's really ingenious, um, particularly I think for kids clothing. So, um, this is a baby surprise jacket. Oh, I did um, find some really cute cork buttons. Found some cork buttons and some matching thread to put the buttons on. Um, oh, the one modification, and I am gonna talk about the yarn that I used for this, is that I uh, slipped the last stitch of every row with the yarn in front, which if you saw a previous episode, I talked about how I got this tip from Amy Palco and um, I've used it on shawls and it's especially good for garter stitch things. So you end up with this beautiful um, slip stitch edge. The yarn that I used for this was a new to me yarn. So this yarn is made by a company called Amano, and it is their Sammy yarn. It is a DK weight, so that's 300 meters over 100 grams, or 328 yards over 100 grams. It's organic Pima cotton from Peru, and um, it's a two-ply. It's um, 
Did I say DK weight? It's a light, it's a light DK. I would probably call this sport myself. And it's got a moderate twist. It is buttery soft and light. So the Wimbrel has a little bit more of an edge to it. It's definitely not like um, what some people call dishcloth cotton or anything like that. This is much softer than that. This is super, super soft, like cottony, pillowy, soft. This was also a yarn that came from the local yarn store I've been frequenting, and it was a new to me yarn. And again, I was sort of faced with the choices about um, how to make this. This garment is for a new colleague and friend that lives here in San Diego, and they are expecting their first child in June. And I don't know them well enough to know what kind of care they are interested in um, engaging in for their um, baby clothes. And so I also, again, wanted something that was machine washable. So uh, they had a sample adult garment knit out of this in the store. And I've been thinking a lot about that. But again, it was a great opportunity to make a smaller project, have a smaller financial investment and a smaller time investment and get a little bit of experience working with this yarn. And before I leave San Diego, I am um, aiming to find a color and make myself a summer top maybe on the on the drive home in this in this material because it was also again like really really nice to work with i don't know that much about the sourcing of the cotton for this yarn other than that it comes from peru um, the uh so the company's website didn't have a lot of information provided in english about the sourcing but they did have a journal or blog section that seemed to be really full of information but i don't speak spanish and i did not go uh into google translate and try to piece together what was going on but what I am going to do is in the learning section, I'm going to talk a little bit more about a resource that gives us all some good overview information about the um, pros and cons of a lot of different materials of which cotton is one. So I'll talk about that more towards the end. Uh, so I had these two garments that I made, the Love Notes by Tin Can Knits and the Baby Surprise Jacket by Elizabeth Zimmerman. And I was like sorting my yarn and I put these two on the table next to each other. So these were the leftovers, uh, not these, but the, there were leftovers from um, the projects. And the more I saw these next to each other, the more I loved these colors together. So I started to think a little bit about what I could do to use the colors together. And I also was interested in kind of another like easy palette cleanser. I've been working on some larger garments and I wanted something else really quick and easy. And I realized by looking at the yarn weights that if I doubled this, it was almost the same as this. So I started to think about how I could use that. And I went back to a very tried and true pattern for me, which is the Flax by Tin Can Knits. And this is what I made. Dun -dun, another adorable, tiny human being garment. So um, this is using uh, Sammy Doubled and Wimbrel Single. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the pattern because this is a wonderful pattern. And, um, but the only, the modifications I made, I used Twisted Rib, which I don't think the pattern calls for. And I added in the striping which I kept the yellow after the collar, I kept the yellow consistent at two rounds and I gradually increased the pink sections to be more and more rounds. I don't think I said this up front, but I do keep fairly good notes on my projects in Ravelry. So you can always find that information there. And as Ravelry is not accessible to you or you don't use Ravelry, you can always send me a note and I'm happy to share the information in a way that works better. Um, for you. So uh, maybe you can see the stitch definition here actually of the um, the different yarns. Beautiful stitch definition on the Wimbrel. And um, the flax pattern. So this is a free pattern from Tin Can Knits and it's 
also um, very, very widely made. And there's a reason it's widely made. It's part of their simple collection. And if you're not familiar with Tin Can Knits and their simple collection in particular, as well as their paid for patterns, they're well written, they're well tested, they're well tech edited, they often have links embedded to written and or video materials, and they're a really, um, I find their patterns really wonderful from the design and the aesthetic, but also the way the patterns are put together. And um, this pattern, flax, actually comes in, uh, the instructions exist in two different weights. So I'm just looking now, the flax, which this one is, which calls for an Aran or a worsted weight, yeah, has um, 23,000 projects right now on Ravelry and flax light has um, just under 12,000 and it's in fingering weight. I think one of the reasons it's so popular is that it's a very easy, very adaptable pattern. It's a great pattern to learn on, and it's also a great pattern to riff on. So the um, design detail that's most prominent about this is it has this garter stitch panel that goes down the sleeves. So on both sleeves, there's this, I don't know, uh, I think 18 stitch maybe. Um, or that might vary with the sizes, I'm not sure. There's a stitch panel that goes down the middle. And if you um, search on Instagram or on Ravelry for, uh, for this sweater, you'll find all kinds of super creative riffs that people have done on this. I've seen people just do it in plain stockinette. So especially if this is a first garment for you or you really want something um, where you're not having to pay attention to any of the design detail like that, you don't have to do this garter just detail. Do um, you can just knit every round instead of alternating the knitting and purling on the sleeves. Um, I've also seen a lot of people do um, different cable or other stitch patterns in this panel. So whatever the stitch number is for the size that you're making, you can find another stitch pattern. It can be really fun to look in um, stitch pattern books or look up cable patterns and, um, or if you have another garment where you really loved making a stitch pattern or let's say you're interested to make a more complicated cabled garment. If you want a little bit of practice on a cable pattern, um, this would be a great place I think to experiment with that. Um, so this is going to, oh, I have one more thing I want to say about that, which is that, um, there are adult size, you know, the, the, the tin can knit patterns in general are um, really inclusive from a size perspective. They often go from newborn to five or six X. They, they have a wide, wide range of sizes that are included in their patterns, including in their free patterns. And um, so uh, some friends and I decided that we, we have a friend who's a very experienced and very skilled knitter who had not done an adult um, sweater before. She'd done lots of baby sweaters, lots of shawls, lots of socks, lots of hats, lots of, you know, hand warming things really, uh, but had never done a, uh, an adult garment before. And so we decided to do a uh, knit along with the three of us and we all did the flax. And what was so wonderful about my friend is that she um, took a lot of her sock yarn leftovers laid them out in front of her and put them kind of in a flow that she really liked the color transitions and she basically made up her own fade in the first time that she ever knit a sweater and it came out so amazing and I'm going to share some photos again either in one of these corners or I might just do an overlay. So my dear friend Ange just absolutely wowed me with what she did. And I think this is a great example of where this can be like a learning item. If you're new to knitting, if you're new to garment making, if you want to experiment with fading or marling or techniques, it's a great, it's a great place to experiment. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say about these um, baby items are that uh, this guy and this guy are going to the same the same family. This this one's a little smaller, so this might be a more immediate wear. And this one is, you know, maybe an immediate wear, but also a longer term wear. And one of the things I like to do when I can is when I gift um, this kind of thing to people, I saved two of the ball bands and put little pieces of the yarn through so they knew which one came from which. And I included an extra button on here. 
Can you see that? That's, that's the back. There's the front of the button. So I'll tie this on to the gift bag or the ribbon or what, however I end up um, gifting this to them. And that way they um, will have the information about uh, care and things like that. And I think this is an, a nice and easy way for them to be able to understand what, what is in. Um, particularly for these friends, I think they're, they're very... Uh, concerned and involved with things like organic materials, and I think they will appreciate seeing the information and being able to read even more about it um, for themselves. So that's what I like to do with that. The last finished object that I want to talk about is a pair of socks that are a part of the sock experiment. So if this is the first episode that you've watched, I am conducting a kind of a long-term project uh, that I'm calling the sock experiment, where I'm really interested in answering the question for myself about how different materials hold up in socks over time. So I'd like to know, do I really need nylon in my socks? Or is that kind of um, not really necessary? Or do I just need some kind of strengthener? Will they last as long if I use mohair, silk, hemp, linen, some other kind of strengthener, or does it need to be nylon? Um, does it matter the number of plies in the yarn? Is that really the key to the longevity? Is it really more about the gauge and the number of plies? So that's those are the kind of questions that I'm interested in for myself. And the way I am helping to answer that question for myself is called the sock experiment. So I have knit and continue to knit socks in a really wide range of materials and um, I'm knitting them at all a pretty tight gauge I would say. So I am keeping the gauge reasonably consistent. I'm generally keeping the foot consistent um, being in stockinette or maybe keeping a design element just at the center top or just on the leg so it doesn't interfere. I'm not, I'm not introducing anything else into the foot where the wear really happens. And I'm also keeping the wash method consistent. So I am doing a gentle hand wash even for the super wash yarns that I'm including in the experiment. So, uh, and the uh, what I'm doing is I am actually tracking every time I wear the socks, how long I wear them, what I'm doing, what shoes they're in, and what kind of wear I notice at the end, and how many times I've washed them. So that is the sock experiment, which by the way, if you or anyone you know might want to participate in data collection in this sock experiment, I would be thrilled to have company in this journey. I think everyone I've talked to about it so far is really interested in what I find, but they're not really that interested in keeping track of all of this information, which I can totally understand and totally appreciate. But if you know somebody like me who finds a lot of joy in uh, also pulling the information together, send them my way. I'm happy to share my template and tracking tools and um, maybe they have more ideas about what we could measure. And the idea is that we could have this sort of pooled information to share more broadly with people. So that's the sock experiment. And um, I'm going to talk quite a bit about the yarn that I used, but this yarn is from Wing and a Prayer Farm. And it is their Vermont flock yarn, which um, I'll wait and get into that in just a minute. But here are the socks. So this is the embossed leaves pattern by Mona Schmidt. Um, and I've made this pattern before, but I wanted to make the main modification. It's a, it's a cuff down with this really fun, easily memorizable lace pattern. You can easily adjust how long or short you want the cuff to meet your needs. It's a traditional heel flap and gusset. And then the pattern actually calls for the lace to continue across the top of the foot. But because these were being made to be part of the sock experiment, I really was kind of fussy about not wanting to even potentially introduce holes along the side of the foot that might um, contribute to some sort of um, hole over time. So I did the foot in stockinette. So these also went really fast. It was really fun. I did these mostly in the car because I was working top down and this, you know, 
for me at least the you know I just want to get through that segment of the pattern before I stop and and this kind of potato chippy you know just one more row just one more pattern repeat kind of thing really happened for me and then I had to pay more close attention to turn the heel I don't do a traditional I, I rarely go from the cuff down and I don't do a lot of heel flap and gusset. So I had to pay more attention um, to that. And then when I got to the foot, this was just like, this just flew. It went by so fast. And um, then I Kitchener stitched the toe together. So, um, and these socks are, are holding up really well. Let me see. Uh, oh, I, uh, I knit them at a gauge of 36 stitches over four inches. And this is a sport weight yarn, which I'm going to talk a lot more about the yarn, but it is sport weight. It's 338 meters or 370 yards per uh, 100 grams. And um, so usually with a fingering weight yarn, I tend to get closer to 36, 37, 38 uh, stitches over four inches, more on the 38 more often than not with a light fingering I can often get close to 39 or 40 stitches over four inches So this is still pretty tight at 36 over four inches That's often the gauge that's called for with a fingering weight yarn and I got it using a sport weight yarn And I still really like the way the fabric feels um, I have worn these nine times. It's been a combination of wearing them around town in clogs and wearing them quite a bit around the house on wooden floors. And so every time, and they've been washed three times. So every time I take them off, I just take a look at how they're wearing. And I will say what's happening with these, which is happening with most of my socks at around that time, is that I'm getting a little pilling on the foot. this is not a problem. I, I don't have anything that looks like it's starting to be um, something that might become a hole or anything like that. But it is, I'm starting to see the wear for me, particularly on the ball of my feet. That's where I get the most wear, but I always look them over and look at the heel. But I would say this yarn so far is holding up really well. So let's talk a little bit about this yarn. This is um, Vermont Flock yarn made by Wing and a Prayer Farm. Uh, not to be confused with uh, Vermont Sock Yarn by Wing and a Prayer Farm. This is the new version where she has replaced the nylon with mohair. So I'm going to talk quite a bit more about this. So this is very special yarn, in my opinion. The yarn comes completely from animals that Farmer Tammy raises um, on her property. And um, she has a number of different breeds of sheep and um, angora goats and some other animals as well. And she also has um, a beautiful dye garden. So uh, this particular yarn has been dyed with Coreopsis flower that she grows in her dye garden. If you've watched any of my episodes before, you might know that I really like to dive a little deeper and learn about the animals that are involved in creating these beautiful materials that we get to work with. So this yarn is made from pole dorset, merino, and mohair. And I talked quite a bit about uh, merino sheep in a previous episode that I'll link down below. Um, but I would like to talk a little bit about what I've learned about the pole dorset and about um, mohair. So uh, dorsets are um, apparently quite prevalent here in um, the United States. I, I read in a few places that they're like the number two or number three um, sheep that's raised here in the United States. And part of what drives that is, I guess they're easier to raise on, on many levels, but they're also, they, they are able to um, breed at any time of the year. So um, for people who are farming, who are interested in um, selling the lambs for meat, this is a uh, often why the dorsets are chosen. So um, they, they, I think the, the original breeds, so this is a pole dorset, but the original dorset breeds have these horns and they're like these kind of curly cue horns. I'm gonna try to find a picture that I can um, put in so you can see them. And so pole or polled, 
P-O-L-L or P-O-L-L-E-D is without those horns. So this doesn't mean that the horns have been cut off or anything like that. It means they have been bred with a uh, the genetic mutation. So when, when ewes gave birth to um, rams that did not have those horns, they were able to maneuver the breeding in such a way that they developed a breed that doesn't grow the horns. So they are uh, considered an all-purpose sheep. So as you might imagine, they are um, producing a lot of milk. So if you're producing a lot of lambs, you're producing a lot of milk. So there's there are lambs, there are milk, and uh, there's meat, and there's also uh, the fleece. So uh, for those of us who are interested in the fleece, um, what I was reading on some spinning websites and more raw fiber websites in particular is that this fleece is often chosen for a few reasons. One is that the fleece is almost completely white. Um, so even other more white uh, colored sheep often, I guess, have flecks of darker colors in their um, fur, and this is almost completely white. And another reason this material is often chosen um, from a fiber perspective is that the way the crimping goes in all different directions ends up producing yarn that has a lot of spring and cushion. And so, um, and I will say this yarn was a pleasure to work with and um, created a really enjoyable final product. Um, so that's what I learned a little bit about the dorset and the pole dorset. The mohair I'd like to talk a little bit more about because this was the first time that I have included, this was the first time I had worked with mohair, and this was the first time I've included a sock made with mohair to replace the nylon in sock yarn. So mohair comes from the Angora goat. Not to be confused with Angora wool, which comes from the Angora rabbit, but mohair comes from Angora goats, which are pretty small goats that, um, other than their face and their legs, they're totally covered in these um, long ringlets of um, mohair. The Angora goats can be shorn twice a year, and um, the resulting mohair is often referred to as nature's nylon because of its strength. But I think as we've seen as, knit as knitters over the last couple of years, there's been a huge trend in holding mohair with another yarn for a design effect. There are so many patterns and designers out there working with this to, um, to create a bit of a halo and um, in, the, in the final garment. And also I've seen it used for some really interesting effect um, from a color perspective. So changing colors and fading as you go down, but holding the same color of mohair throughout the project really creates this very visually interesting and appealing um, final product. Uh, I have not yet worked with mohair until this project because there have been a lot of concerns raised <clears throat> and documented from a lot of different sources about the extremely inhumane conditions for these Angora goats in many places around the world. And so for me, it has not been the right decision to purchase mohair. But when I saw that Farmer Tammy was offering mohair in her sock yarn that was from goats that she raised on her small farm, I felt like this was the right opportunity to give this a try. I also want to fully acknowledge, you know, mohair is a, a more expensive product to start with. And when you add to that, you know, um, buying it from a small farm where it's all natural yarns, it's, you know, been hand dyed with flowers that are grown on the property. This is more indulgent yarn for me and a more expensive yarn. And I'm really, really interested to see how this holds up uh, over time. And I am, I am hopeful uh, and also hopeful that more small farmers um, who are raising their flocks with great care and concern for the animals are able to um, offer their fibers to people and um, 
that they can be included in things like sock yarn. In terms of works in progress and what's coming up next, um, I have two things on my needles right now. One is a pair of socks and one is a um, color work project that I'm really excited about. It's a short sleeve pullover top that I think is going to work for spring and fall and probably the cooler and less humid days of summer and I really love how the design is coming out so I'm really excited to show that to you. And the other thing that came off my needles last week is a really wearable cardigan that had some new to me techniques. So um, I see this is yet again already a really long episode and so I'm gonna save that cardigan and maybe the color work um, top for the next episode. In terms of the learning pieces for today, I really want to just highlight three different resources and I'm going to point you um, down below in the in the show notes for where you can dig in. One I already referred to a little bit earlier and that is the um, a series of blog posts that were done to explain um, a lot of the pros and cons basically from different materials. And I thought that this was done in a really, really thoughtful way. It was um, made by uh, Amy Schur and her, um, so she's a, a knitwear designer and she has the thoughtfully made fiber vlog cast and she writes, so this was a blog post um, called choosing fibers that align with your values and your project. And what I really appreciate about this article and about Amy's approach is that it's very thoughtful. She has big disclaimers up front about there will be no yarn shaming, whatever yarn you use and the choices that you're making are yours to make. And every material has its pros and cons. And she puts together a pretty well-researched summary of what some of those pros and cons are. So I, would encourage you to check out that um, those blog posts. I think it's a series of two, and um, as well as her vlog cast and um, her designs as well. The second thing I want to mention is just a quick reel I saw on Instagram that I'll put a link down to below. I don't know about you, but I pull things out a lot. I will change my mind or I'll want to start over. And a woman who goes by the handle Hannah Bell Knits made a little video clip about even if you don't have a Swift or um, any sort of special tools, how you can reclaim yarn from a project and not end up with what she called yarn ramen, which I could really relate to having just frogged um, a sock project that I have big yarn ramen. So I'm going to do her technique one of these days and, and uh, rewind that ball. So I'll point you to that. And then the third thing I wanted to point to is a woman named Melissa who has an unbelievable channel on YouTube called Mel Make Stuff. She's a sewist as well as a fiber artist, and I, the knowledge that she both has and shares and her ability to communicate pretty complicated information really succinctly, I just, every episode I watch, I'm completely sucked in. She creates really interesting things, and she really talks you through the process as she's making the garment. And um, the specific episode that I really want to refer you to and that I'll link down below um, is kind of related to my sock experiment in terms of like wanting to do things that increase the longevity of our handmade socks. And she talks about how she shapes her toes to better match the shape of her actual foot and how she feels like that's very related to the sustainability of the final object because you know, she doesn't have a toe poking through somewhere or stretching on the fabric. She's actually made the garment to mimic the shape of her body and how that helps with longevity. So I thought that was really interesting and I will link that down below. I don't have much to share on the life update part. Um, it's pretty much what I mentioned in the last episode. We are getting ready to move apartments. We have been in Ocean Beach for six weeks and we are moving... Uh, 15 miles up the coast to another neighborhood in San Diego County. And um, this is a little bit of our kind of splurge uh, for the trip. It was, it was not in our budget to stay on the beach 
for most of this time, but we have rented a property for um, the next week or so where we are right on the water. And so I hope I am able to record at least one segment on the, um, the balcony there so you can see the ocean in the background. And I am certainly looking forward to um, it is open window uh, season here. We have the windows open almost 24 seven. And so <clears throat> listening to the waves and, and hearing the sound of the ocean out the window, I think is um, gonna be really something to look forward to. So I can't wait for that. And then we uh, start to head home. So we're gonna take um, about three weeks to travel back across the country, going through national parks in Utah and in Southern New Mexico. We're gonna spend a little bit of time in Austin, Texas, where I haven't been in quite some time and I'm sure it has changed a lot. And then we're gonna drive home through um, the state of Tennessee and see my sister, Ellen, who lives in the Smoky Mountains. So we'll see her on the way home and then we will land back in the Hudson Valley in, um, early April. So I, uh, that's what's going on on our end. So I will wrap this up now and say, uh, if you've never stayed to the very end of the video before, I do put um, video clips and photographs at the end if that's interesting to you to listen to, um, to, to sorry, to watch while you listen to the beautiful music. Um, Ella Ray Kondrat just has an incredible voice and this is my favorite song that she sings, and I was very thrilled to get her permission to use it in this um, in this podcast. And um, yeah, so uh, that's what's at the end. And hug your loved ones, and I will see you soon. Bye. Exactly as you are